everyone, and welcome back to the Kidlit Chronicles. This is Nikki. This is Chelsea. And this is Hannah. On this show, we talk about kids' books, mostly the ones that we loved as kids of the early 2000s. So think Warriors, The Hobbit, Coraline, and Percy Jackson. Sometimes we also read modern books and interview authors. In this episode, we interview an author, Erica Lewis, about her middle grade fantasy book, Kelsey Murphy and the Academy for the Unbreakable Arts, which is the first in a trilogy of books inspired by Celtic mythology. A little bit about Erica. She is a fantasy author based in LA who's written all kinds of magical books and graphic novels, including Game of Shadows, The Color of Dragons, and Firebrand. This book is about Kelsey Murphy, a 12-year-old girl who doesn't know anything about her own background. She accidentally gets brought into the other world, a war-torn region where some people have fantastical powers. There she enrolls in the Academy for the Unbreakable Arts, hoping to develop her own newly discovered powers and learn more about her family. But when evil creatures start attacking the school, Kelsey must work together with her classmates to protect each other and discover the source of the trouble. We talked with Erica about Celtic mythology, how she went about writing such complex characters, and the complicated process of learning empathy as a middle schooler. Also, disclaimer, we avoid spoiling any major plot points from book one in this episode, but we have a pretty spoilery section towards the end, so check the description if you want to avoid that part. Don't forget to rate us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram and YouTube at The Kid Light Chronicles and at Kid Light Chronicle on Twitter. And as always, enjoy the episode. I guess where we wanted to start was just to kind of ask you a little bit more about you and your career. Um, You know, I I did a little research and I saw Uh that you you've written like a lot of different types of books for different audiences. Uh, You know, you've done adult fantasy, you've done graphic novels and, you know, Kelsey Murphy is middle grade fiction. I also know that you had a long career in television before turning to writing full time. And, uh, you know, before we start recording, we were talking about how you went to Vanderbilt. And I saw I I read that you had majored in math, which is uh, super (laughs) surprising to me. Um, So you've had kind of like a very interesting, maybe not super linear career. And yeah, I was wondering how you got into writing, if that was something that you always wanted to do. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the the last part of that question about uh, the writing part, um, I had a really hard time learning to read. Uh, when I was young, um, I don't think anybody ever noticed. Parents weren't around as much back then. You know, we were Gen X. That was the whole like, you know, everybody's always talking about how we were always left to our own devices. But that was pretty true. And so people didn't catch these things as much as they should have. And so it wasn't until I was probably in the fifth or sixth grade that you know, teachers started noticing and was trying to get me to read more. Um, and uh, it was all about, you know, like exercising the muscles in your eyes. That was one of the biggest problems that I was having was that I just couldn't comprehend what I was reading. Now uh, it would be diagnosed as a form of dyslexia because some of my, my uh, the sentence, sometimes even when I'm typing, I'll write a sentence backwards. And I don't even realize I'm doing it until after I go back and I reread it. And so something wasn't quite gelling in, in my brain brain properly um so for me the idea of writing even though I was living in my imagination 24 7 it felt like uh I had a really hard time expressing those things and when I got to college I didn't know what to major in I was really good in math because it I think partly because it didn't involve a lot of reading it was easy for me to comprehend the formulas and memorize things and figure things out that way and I've always thought very um mathematically and you can kind of see it in my stories because I tend to tie things together a lot you know like there's got to be an equation at the end not there's nothing going to be in there that's not going to have some sort of something later on whatever it is um that's it's my brain works that way so for me when I got out of uh I went to Vanderbilt and I did major in math um because I was good at it but I also uh took a lot of theater um, and, and I had no idea what I was going to do. I, um, it was quite the luxury actually. Um, but while I was there, I spent, uh, a year in, um, London and, and uh, abroad, semester abroad and traveling all over, which was the beginnings of my love for Celtic mythology, um, which is in a lot of, I think a, a good majority of the stuff that I actually write these days. Um, so that was really wonderful. And when I got out of school, I was fortunate enough um, to be given an internship at CNN back in the day. This was a long time ago. Uh, it was in Atlanta. 
And so I was there for four years. I was at CNN for two of those and discovered that news was not my my cup of tea. But it was the first time (laughs) I was ever invited to write anything because they just didn't have enough people writing. And so I got to write on headline news and because they were like, no, you're good at this. And I'm like, no, I'm terrible at this. They're like, no, you can actually do this. It was like this really funny banter I had with the guy who was running the newsroom at the time and he's like it's okay just sit down regurgitate the ap wire it's gonna be fine you know so uh that's what headline news was right so um i did that and then i knew i wanted to go work in scripted television and that brought me out to los angeles so i was here working in television um i think my first job was actually at william morris as a it was i should i know my own background <laughs> my first job was at william morris as an assistant there uh which was a great uh way to meet people um and then i moved over to sony and uh, fox and then nbc universal and so i moved around a lot but always doing um uh, development, which is technically what they consider buying the projects that would ultimately then be developed into pilots and, and series, um, or what they call doing current programming, which was managing the process of these shows, uh, working with the writers and the directors and hiring all those people and making sure they stay within budgets and also managing the creative aspect for the show, which is where I got my first taste of really the idea of wanting to tell my own stories. It's like, you know, I, I was always working on other people's stories and trying to give them notes to make theirs better. And I was like, well, what about all those stories I've always wanted to tell and had never been able to do it? I was like, okay. After NBC Universal, um, when I was there, actually, I started writing. Uh, and towards the end of my contract there, I sold my first graphic novel, um, which is called The 49th Key. Um, and uh, and then I also sold Game of Shadows to tour books. And, and that sort of started my writing journey. Oh, there is a lot to unpack in what you just said. Um, <laughs> but we always love like hearing kind of how like writers that we interview get their start, um, especially because all three of us have a humanities background. Um, yeah. Like Hannah's an illustrator. I'm I'm a journalist, oh, cool. actually. So yeah. it's really awesome to hear kind of how you had a hand in all of those different fields. And now you're also writing novels, which is awesome. I think you can do any. I mean, you know, I, people always dismiss it when, when we say storytelling is just storytelling and you can do it in different formats. And it takes a while. I mean... You have to find your own voice in these things because that's what draws attention to things these days and um because there's a lot of voices out there and so what makes your voice unique and and uh, i think i'm still trying to figure that out in some ways i think every writer or illustrator their art making it unique um i work with a lot of artists obviously in the comic and i do not draw i mean i draw but like you know <laughs> not, not that kind of draw so um i admire anyone who can draw i think Also, in this time, you don't have to stick with one thing. You can be doing multiple things at once. That idea of a renaissance person is something I think that kind of uh, hopefully is coming back again instead of everybody having to be so regimented to one thing that they do all the time. We can have multifaceted. All of us have to have day jobs. You know, I mean, to, to do art, sometimes you have to have extra ways to make money. To dive into Kelsey Murphy um, more specifically, we were wondering how did the idea for this series come about and um, if any of Kelsey's character was inspired by yourself or other people that you know at all? Uh, Well, on the first question, um, I was on a trip to the Isle of Skye. Uh, which is up in Scotland. Um, Yes. (laughs) One of my favorite places in the world. If you ever get a chance to go, it's just, it's just magical. Fairies, your whole, everything, it just feels enchanted the minute you get there. And um, I was specifically going to see a, um, a castle called Dunsky Castle, which means Fortress of Shadows. And it is actually a Skyhawk, the, um, preceptor, the principal at the school in in the story, it is actually her real school. Uh, The Fortress of Shadows was her real school. It it, it came out of Irish mythology, which is a part of Celtic mythology. And um, she was a warrior teaching goddess who taught all of the biggest heroes in Ireland how to fight with magical weapons and martial arts. And she had this bridge of leaping, which of course is in my bridge that did the same thing, it would throw you off if you tried to cross it. And so uh, I went there and um, we, I, I saw it and I was like, I have to use, this has to be a part of the setting 
uh, in my story. And um, after Game of Shadows tour was like, you know, you have a really great voice and you think it would be awesome for middle grade. Would you consider doing us a, a story in Celtic mythology for middle grade? And that's how Kelsey came to be. Um, on the characters, I can tell you that Stryker uh, is definitely my golden retriever. Uh, <laughs> so um and actually uh instead of a he, he he was a she and she actually this is our our first golden retriever she passed away a lot of these were modeled after real history uh in terms of their uh personas and, and that kind of stuff so like coach blackwell and and um uh, uh madame Ledu and some of the teachers specifically were modeled after uh, people that I had, you know, like I had a French teacher growing up uh, at school and she's exactly like her. And, you know, so there's like some, there's some, there's some things like that on the students themselves and Kelsey. Um, I, I don't think I could say that I modeled them specifically after anyone in particular. Uh, I think that there's a, a bit of me in Kelsey. I think a lot of us, I mean, it's hard not to put some of a personality in that. Um, she's a strong-willed character. I think she's much more strong-willed than I was at her age and much more capable because she's been so independent for so long. Um, I was, uh, you know, heart-pounding, even talking and public speaking was horrifying to me, you know. And Kelsey's got this sort of um, beaten down, I've already been through it all kind of approach to life, uh, which... Um, is good and it's bad at that age because clearly it, it impedes her making friendships and trying to sort of figure out how to do that over the course of the story. Uh, but yeah, the, they're just now they're kind of all from my imagination. Niall specifically uh, being born limb different, meaning with only one hand was actually something that my editor and I discussed her. Um, she's, she was my acquiring editor, Elaine Becker. She's no longer there anymore. She's actually an author herself. She wrote Forest Born and, and she's, she's amazing. Um, but Elaine was like, you know, it'd be really cool to see one of these characters have, you know, I hate to use the word disability because I don't feel like everybody, you know, like for them, when you're born different, it doesn't make you feel like you're disabled. You're just, you're different. You're a little different. And so she, he was born without a hand and she was like, you know, try, can you do that? And I said, I think, I, I think I can do that. So I had to go do it. I did a lot of research and a lot of conversations, talked to people. Um, it, was, it was it was probably a good six months in addition to the research for um, uh, just Celtic mythology, the Irish mythology. So on top of everything else, but it was worth it because I think he's one of my favorite characters. So I'd say he's probably he might be my favorite character after Kelsey. Like, I just think yeah. that he's such a sweetheart. Yeah. Yeah, we were going to ask you about your Celtic mythology inspiration, but you answered that already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that in graveyards. Love them so much. <laughs> um, but the next question, basically also about Celtic mythology. Um, I remember, like, when we were younger, like, we're all, like, in our early 20s. Um, yeah. Like, all the books that I feel like we would see or we're about like Greek mythology. <laughs> like there is yeah. of course like Percy Jackson. There's like a bunch of informational books about Greek mythology too. And we had to read like mythology in school, which is about Greek mythology. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so like I feel like I haven't really seen much about Celtic mythology until like watching I don't know if you've seen like Cartoon Saloon, like that studio in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Their yeah, movies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those are amazing. Yeah, they those are amazing. <laughs> they have great well, and they're bringing some of the same stories. Celtic mythology is such a big blanket uh mm -hmm. word because the Celts spread all the way from Ireland all the way across Europe. So you you're almost getting over into Russia by the time you're talking about the um the, the expanse of how these people traveled and their mythologies were all similar in some regards, but different. So, you know, even the Basque mythologies in Spain, they don't necessarily have creation myths where, you know, in, in Greek mythology, you, you have the story of the Titans bursting out of the head. And, you know, that there was a, like a creation myth. In Norse mythology, you have a creation myth. In, in Irish myth mythology specifically, it's, it's really fascinating because, um, they 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 speak of of like the Tuatha as as coming down from the stars, as if they were from somewhere else. And you know, 
for lack of a better term, colonized Ireland. <laughs> so they came into Ireland and their stories are all about that. They're all about wars and about one battle after another, which was a big inspiration for Kelsey's story because it's about a never ending war that needs to come to an end. Um, and so th they, it, a lot of these Celtic mythologies are all very individual and different in Ireland, it has one set of mythologies. In Wales, it's it's more spirits of the land. It has different sets of gods and goddesses. And the same with Scotland, right? And France has their own. Like, everybody has their individual ones. But it's all sort of under this big umbrella that's called Celtic mythology. With Greek mythology, it was always very, you know, this is what happened. And these are the the, the characters in our in our mythologies and um, how they translated into Rome, uh, Roman mythology. But I think it had to do with the part of the world they were in, right? those names traveled instead of changing terms instead of being called Danu, Mari, you know, eventually a lot of these were changed um, specifically because the Christianity moved in. So like M-A-R-I is, is not that different from Mary. Right. So a lot of these, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, but, but it's all Celtic. It's all under this one big blanket. So I think it's harder to delineate them um and you don't you still don't see a lot of those uh you see pieces of them come into things lamia i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right you know different kinds of creatures that have um are in these european mythologies they'll pop up all the time in, in anime or you know something fun like that you know uh so i i don't know it's um I think that might be why, but it's weird that it, it is interesting that the that U.S. schools specifically adopted Greek mythology. So like, this is the mythology you're going to learn about. <laughs> but I guess it does make sense. Like, I guess you're saying like Celtic mythology is a bit less easy to follow <laughs> or Greek mythology is a lot more straightforward. Uh, yeah, in many ways, it's it's more like the name of a, of a culture and a people over a really big space. Like if you typed in, in in a search engine Celtic mythology, you'd get everything in there, right? It would just bring in everything from all different places as opposed to just one. So, yeah. I did a bit of typing in Celtic mythology into Google search yeah. while reading. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was a bit lost. So I'm glad that <laughs> it's very easy to like learn new things from Kelsey Murphy, like the book itself, just because I feel like you introduce the the mythology in a really easy to understand way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That, <laughs> you know, that's a really hard thing to do because I really appreciate that you saying that. Uh, it, uh, sometimes it feels like an info dump. And, you know, mm. on first drafts, you're like, okay, this is where we have to explain what King Baylor's evil eye is. You know what I mean? And like, there's this, okay, how do, you know, but you don't want it to sound like an info dump and where exactly should these little pieces come out and almost everything in there is strictly out of their um their legends this idea of this you know eye and the different things it can do and all that yeah that was like my favorite i think piece of the mythology um i thought it was very vivid super cool like you know the different lids of the eye and the different uh consequences that would happen if they were open yeah uh, it was a yeah. super great way of building like tension throughout the entire book of like what's going to happen next Oh, uh, thank you. So next, we wanted to uh, ask you about the dens that the different students are categorized into based on their powers, because we thought those were really fun. So um, just to give a bit of introduction to them, I guess, there are chargers who are going to be the leaders in each Fianna, which is a group of students. And so the charger is always in charge of that group. And they have um, superhuman strength, and they also have a connection with horses. Um, and then there's ravens who shapeshift into ravens and cats who can shapeshift into different felines. Um, then there's the adders and they have telepathic abilities. And then lastly is the segas. They control the elements like fire, earth, water, or air. Um, so we were wondering if those categories of powers exist in Celtic mythology and how much of that you came up with or how much you uh, kind of fleshed out after or from the original mythology? Uh, Celtic mythology itself was very connected in Irish mythology, specifically to different kinds of animals um, representing certain things. Um, they uh, cat cheese, which are their sort of um, shape-shifting, uh, the she meaning fairy world, uh, the idea of something that is a she, 
uh, meaning like like a kushi, the way striker is that um, type of thing is just exists. Whether they were catchies and the cat, being able to morph into all different kinds of cats, that was more me, just because I thought it would be so much more fun to have something be able to morph from one cat like right into another as when I get to be really good at what they do. Um, ravens and crows specifically to Irish and Celtic mythology have usually dark implications, meaning grim, I guess I should use the word grim. Um, and because with uh, some secrets, which I don't want to reveal if you haven't read book one about Kelsey, about Brona, about all these connections to ravens were something that I knew I needed to have. Whether it was going to be a crow or a raven, uh, that particular one I knew right right away that that had to be one of the dens. Um, and then with chargers and horses, it's it's it was it was sort of a natural thing. This idea of this strength and leadership, and um, having a character specifically like Zephyr, who's definitely afraid of horses, even though he comes from a farm. <laughs> and so this idea of having to get over that kind of fear and also get over trying to grow into being a leader. So it kind of stemmed out of both. I felt like chargers, you know, the idea of somebody sitting on a horse and being the one drop, you know, running into battle first. Um, it just was there in my brain. Um, but yeah, they have a, a goddess of horses. And so they have like a lot of mythology around horses. Sega's um, specifically uh comes from a little something else. So Fomorians, the idea of a Fomorian is literally right out of Irish history. Um, they were the original, uh, they were living in Ireland uh, when the goddesses and goddesses from the lands of summer, which you read about uh, the Tuatagan and came down into Ireland. So they were fighting wars against them. So it was like being colonized, right? These gods and goddesses were coming in, they were battling with the Fomorians who happened to have a horrible evil king named King Baylor at the time. Um, and so they were a different culture altogether. So they're actually they're very different. And so it was really important for, in my mind to have them have very different powers and some somewhat scary powers uh, because they were at one point an enemy and seen as very dangerous. One, some of the research I've read when I was doing the book had when, when these lands were all connected as one continent, uh, that a lot of these settlers originally in Ireland came from the, the Asian area, where uh, not Mongolia, but a little further towards Russia, all up in there, right? So I wanted something culturally, some sort of connection to that, to the Fomorians, and uh, elemental powers just um, felt like it fit, because there's probably nothing more scary as a a cat to walking up to somebody who's literally got fire burning. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you're one big fireball. You're just, you're completely flammable from head to toe. And so I kept thinking to myself, what would really be nerve wracking to anyone would have these elementals. And, and when you look into their lore, into the real legends of King Baylor, these were elemental things he was causing to happen. And so that's why the Segas had elementals. I specifically chose Sega antelopes because of the location of where they're typically found and uh, giving a connection to the, the the continent of Asia with the Fomorians. Yeah, with the Fomorians. Yeah, I thought they were really interesting as well. And also how I feel like, you know, you said like colonization, like the, I guess, are they, would they be called like the children of Danu or like that sort of society colonized the Fomorians? Exactly. That's exactly what happened. There was also another culture there called Firbolg. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that's right. It's like F I R B O L G. There were there were a couple other um, clans groups. Um, in my mind, the poor Fomorians were there. <laughs> these these really supernaturally powerful people came down and were trying to bulldoze them out. So I see. Um, yeah. yeah, and then ironically, interestingly enough, the one character. Uh, Lou, who's King Baylor's grandson, um, uh, who ended up being the one to kill him in, in the ancient mythologies, uh, he was born from both worlds. And you see a lot of times in uh, early Irish history where the clans in Ireland much preferred to marry off a daughter or a son rather than go to war. He was born of both. And so this idea of merging cultures was very um, a big part of Irish history. Oh. So. 
kind of like with Kelsey, I guess, like how. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no yeah. spoilers, but <laughs> kind of like that. <laughs> Speaking of Kelsey, um, I wanted to ask you kind of about her characterization, her character development, because uh, something that I like really loved about her, and it's you know very related to her family history and her identity as a Fomorian, is that she is a pretty heavily flawed main character. Um, you know, I, in the books that we've read for the podcast, like we see a lot of Mary Sue and Gary Stew protagonists, you know, like where they, they're, they're an orphan, you know, they're, they've endured like a lot of really hard life events, but they're somehow still like incredibly perfect and like talented at everything. And just, they, they can overcome any problem. Um, and Kelsey's not like that, you know. She has trust and anger issues from being abandoned in childhood, and she kind of has to fight against this darker, more selfish side with everything that's going on, um, and kind of feeling ostracized, at least in the beginning, at school. Uh, so I really like that about her, that she, you know, isn't just perfect at everything, and she isn't just good, uh, you know, period. Yeah. So how did you go about writing like such an emotionally complicated but still ultimately sympathetic main character? Ah, well, thank you. I, you know, um, and I don't want to use any examples about, you know, big um, book series out there, but there are certain series that, uh, especially in, in, in the middle grade space to me that feel felt, don't feel authentic. I have kids this age. I've, raise them I've been around them all and um one of the things uh that needs I felt like with Kelsey needed to be is that her her background it, it does influence anyone's personality we all have things we carry around with us baggage and for her she has a lot she has a lot of trust issues moving around a lot um we don't I don't get too far into the dark side of some of the things she went through but you know, there's hints throughout the storyline of her, you know, having to sleep in a car at one point and having to do different things just to stay safe. And so for her, um, this idea of looking at people as something that's going to be ever giving her something warm and fuzzy just becomes impossible. And so she, when we meet her, she's 12. She's bordering between that 12 and 13 years where things are already getting kind of, you know, you know, there's already some sort of sometimes anger just flares when you're going through these growth spurts. It's just a part of natural part of life. And so for her, I felt it was really important um, to make sure that her reactions were very, very genuine to who she was as a character. Um, the relatability part to me, I think, I think the thing that was really important around Kelsey was to build characters that were going through things that were just as equally difficult for them so that she ultimately didn't realize she had to learn that other people have problems too and they have other things they're going through and sometimes their reactions aren't what you expect and that all just means you know how do i be a friend you know she didn't know how to do that and so i wanted that to be her character journey over the entire story all the other stuff is you know with her background and who she is and finding out who she is and even the magic and the fantasy and all that the the thing that was really important to me was that she like kids you know coming back from a pandemic and kids you know going into the middle school for the first year there's so many new people and and sometimes a person's reaction isn't because of what you said to them or what you did to them it may have nothing to do with you um or they are going through something really hard themselves and you know i feel like i'm i'm quoting ted lasso or something <laughs> but but i think it's really important that that kids from young age learn to be like you know are you okay you know what be empathetic and that's something a skill she's never learned so for me it was it was great to try and to constantly beat her down in every scenario like you know especially when it came to brona who you know frenemies sort of storyline there and her having to really figure out that, you know, she's not the only important person, the only thing that's important to her anymore. I wanted to make sure that she learned that um, there were other people 
uh, around her that were so important to her that all of these other things that were happening bad to her, she could take that moment and be like, no, you're more important right now. I need to sit down and talk to you and find out what's wrong with you instead of being in her own head and trying to push things through. And I just think it's a skill that you learn it. I don't think you're necessarily born that way, right? We're not all born to be like, okay, I'm going to realize that the, that person yelled at me, not because of something I did, but because they're having a bad day, you know? That's definitely true. Yeah. I feel like I remember learning that. <laughs> like I remember yeah, that thought same. process. Yeah, And it's really bad in middle school. And, you know, look, they say eight and up, but it's really fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, like up probably to seventh grade. And it's really that fourth and fifth and sixth graders that are just sort of pushing into middle school where it's like, okay, I've had this group of friends since I was five, potentially, if you're lucky, you've been the same school. Um, but all of a sudden you can have all these new people to deal with. Yeah, you know, it can be a really good experience or a really bad experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. I still yeah. remember the first day of middle school vividly. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the worst. <laughs> the worst. The stomach aches every day going to school. Yeah, it was not fun. It's hard to learn social skills. <laughs> exactly. And that's what you do in middle school. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's all you do in middle school, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh my next question is going to be a bit spoilery so mm -hmm. watch out for that audience <laughs> cover yeah. your ears if you haven't read the first book in the kelsey murphy series <laughs> <laughs> but basically all the kids in fiona 3 like have complicated relationships with their parents you know zephyr's parents don't support him going to the school um like kelsey's parents ab abandon her um, Brona doesn't know her mom, and the queen, who is revealed to be Niall's mom, is seemingly just straightforwardly a pretty bad parent because she won't even acknowledge oh, him. Horrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she won't like talk to him while he's in the room with her. So, my question is why did you feel it was important to portray the parents as like complicated people who can do bad things? Well, without spoiling anything in book two, uh, which is coming out in July, um, every character introduced will will play even more in in the next story. So some of the the introductions that we're learning about here um, about uh, you know Kelsey's um, mother and father and Brona's mother and then with Niles. Um, all of their families, including Zephyrs, go through uh, an, a metamorphosis of their own all the way through the story. Because the story in the next book is not at the school. I mean, it starts at the school, but the, it's it's about the war. And you actually get perspectives from both sides of the war. Because this book series is about ending this war. So yeah, I had to sort of blow open the other world, so to speak. And so in this particular book, when we're meeting their parents, we're meeting it through the kids' perspective. And... Um, we're learning each of them are harboring these certain little issues uh, that they're carrying forward that, that, but we're never, we're not meeting the parents, right? So we're not, we're not hearing the other story. So in this particular one, what they, they all have in common, Zephyr comes from the most grounded family, uh, a very large family. He's the kid in the middle who, who just felt forgotten until of course he decides to come to the academy and they don't want him going to fight in this, what, they perceive as what is a useless war because it just never seems to end. Um, and so for him, uh, unlike the other three who have a little bit more drastic <laughs> parent problems, um, his is probably the most normal family uh, of all of them. Um, and so I wanted all of them to be able to connect in a certain way. When I was deciding their backgrounds, the 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 characters that are Niall's parents and his whole situation with his dad being dad and you know all of that something that is going to even grow bigger throughout the course of the series show where we're meeting Niall's mother at this moment at the end of the book that's the first glimpse that you'll get of her but you'll get a lot more of her and she may change to uh over the course of this series so that there's uh, reason to understand some of the way she was or what wasn't um they're they're not your straightforward disney black and white characters in that way like they're not evil or purely good you know they're they're sort of like all parents straddle that 
am I a horrible parent or I'm a good parent? Because half the time we don't know, right? We're like, I don't know what we're doing. Hopefully we're doing the right thing, but that's the best we can do. And in our case, she is absolutely horrible in our eyes, especially with Niall. But I wanted each of them to have everything that's in the backstory of those characters uh, will will come to fruition as to why they are the way they are. I mean, it is Niall's mother's fault that the situation with Kelsey happened, right? So there's blame games on all sides here, right? And then there's Brona's mother who's connected to Kelsey's mother, right? And I don't want to spoil anything in book two, uh, but, but a lot of these characters that are mentioned, you will see, um, and have a have a, a even more, you know, take on their real personalities and why they were doing things and what they were doing. Very exciting preview yeah. for book two. <laughs> um, yeah, like you said, book two is is coming out July twenty fifth. So I wanted to ask as as we wrap up, what are you most excited for readers to experience in the second book without giving away too much? The thing that I'm really excited about in book two is the fact that we are introduced to the lands of winter in addition to the lands of summer. You know, I, I read a lot of adult fantasy um, and in kids fantasy, it tends to be for me to feel very straightforward. A lot of times it's in first person these days, you know, you're still following the storyline um, where you, you don't know what's happening a lot of times. And in the one thing that I feel really excited about with book two is that there's a winter spy, you know, in the lands of summer. You don't know everything that the spy is doing, but you know the end game. And so there's a there's a whole back and forth to uh, to them trying to one up each other and figure out where each other is. And so that the reader, the entire time, hopefully, is sort of like, are they going to figure this out in time to do X, Y, and Z? And so there's this there's this sort of um, almost like a competition between the two, you know, because we begin in, we actually start the prologue in the lands of winter. And when we begin there, we get an understanding for where they are in the war and what's happening there. And then it's sort of dragged on to the shores of summer. And so for me, uh, I really enjoyed writing this story in that way because it wasn't just, okay, this happened, like, it wasn't like a journey, <laughs> like you're constantly journeying and you're getting from plot A to plot B, you know, point B and moving along. This was, uh, okay, this is happening to them, but what's happening to them because it's told from two perspectives and um, it was really fun. So I'm hoping the readers get, you know, it feels different, hopefully, you know. Well, we wanted to share a little bit about what we're excited about or what we think might happen in book two, if you okay. wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah. So I guess for me, like, I'm really excited to see Niall and Kelsey's relationship develop, you know, because they have a little crush <laughs> on each other. And, and at the end of the book, it's kind of like acknowledged by both of them at the end of book one, um, which is, you know, it's very refreshing how honest they are with each other. I don't think a lot of 12 year olds are, or at least I wasn't very transparent in that way when I was 12. Um, but, you know, like you mentioned before, complicated uh, family dynamics between the two of them, <laughs> to yeah. say the least. Okay. So excited to see how that will develop. Yeah, no spoilers there. <laughs> no spoilers, <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> the spoiler section is over, listener. <laughs> you can listen to this part. <laughs> um, but I think that perhaps the queen will come around. <laughs> That's my prediction, because she has trauma and I think she just needs to, you know, move past that or deal with it in a healthy way. And and then perhaps she won't be so bad. <laughs> I, I again, uh, no, no, spoilers. no spoilers. I think that no spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> I think uh, you're going to get a healthy dose of Queen Iceland in book two. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then for me, I was just um, excited to learn more about the whole lore and the history of the world you've created because it was already so unique, um, like we've talked about in this episode, And it, but it still feels like we've barely kind of scratched the surface. So I was also excited to hear you say we'll learn more about the lands of winter and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the one thing that for me was so much fun 
Um, it also took me a little longer than I expected to write just because there was so much world building to do outside of just the school. But there, there are also some things in, in uh, book two that um, draw on more from Celtic mythology. One of the things we actually just saw in the coronation of King Charles III, uh, the King of England, he, um, I don't know, you guys know the Stone of Destiny is brought down from Edinburgh Castle. Every uh, king or queen in, in England has been coronated sitting on this stone. So it was actually brought down and stuck under King Charles III's seat during his coronation. But in Ireland, they also have the Stone of Destiny on the Hill of Tara. I think these stones are somehow in real history connected. Like one of them gave it to the other one and borrowed it. So who knows which one is the real Stone of Destiny. But it, in history, it would cry out for the next king or queen and when they touched it, right? Sort of like the idea of King Arthur being able to pull the sword out of the stone. Um, so there's a lot of new war, new legend, legendary things that are brought into uh, Easter eggs, so to speak, in in book two as well, which is really fun for me. So I hope you guys find those too. More to learn. Yeah. 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 Based on my zero knowledge of Celtic mythology. <laughs> Same. Same. Yeah. Well, we will leave it there. Erica, thank you so much for talking with us. This was so fun. Uh, we yeah, loved you. your book. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Uh, you can, well, my website is just my name, ericalus.com. It's probably the first place. Um, I'm on all of the socials and I try very hard when people uh, or reach out to me. I absolutely love that and love to, you know, chat about stuff. Um, but that's probably the, my website's probably the place to find out the most about me. As for us, we will be, sorry, what is the third book called? <laughs> I did not. Oh, it's the fourth for, book. We should probably. Do you need to know the name of the? I have it in my oh, bookshelf. Yeah, you watch. can supply the name. You want the <laughs> Percy Jackson before? Hold on. Uh, oh, here it is: the Battle of the Labyrinth. Aha! Uh-huh. That's right. Okay, <laughs> thank I you. I will say my line. As for us, we are going to in the next episode return once again to the world of Percy Jackson. So Greek mythology this time. Andy, our recurring Percy Jackson guest, will be joining us again, and we will be reading book four. Uh, right there. There it is. The Battle of the Labyrinth. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I love his book. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. Thank you for having me.